Good evening. Hi. I'm James Roth, Deputy Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of Alan Price, Director of the Library, and Stephen Rothstein, Executive Director of the Foundation, and all my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming this evening. I also want to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters at the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. And I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. We will be collecting written questions throughout the conversation this evening. Uh, our team will be passing through the hall periodically with cards and pencils, and later to collect your questions. Uh, in this evening's uh, conversation, our panelists will examine the rise of populism in the United States and Europe and explore what these changes mean for the country and for the world. And we are pleased to have this opportunity for this conversation. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's panelists. John B. Judas is editor-at-large at Talking Points Memo and author of eight books, including The Populist Explosion, How the Great Recession Transformed American and European Politics and the Nationalist Revival, Trade, Immigration, and the Revolt Against Globalization. He has written f uh, for numerous, numerous publications, including The New Republic and The National Journal. Selena Zito joined the New York Post in 2016 and is a political analyst for CNN and a staff reporter and columnist for The Washington Examiner. Her weekly syndicated column <clears throat> appears in more than 20 newspapers nationwide. She and Brad Todd are the co-authors of The Great Revolt, Inside the Populist Coalition Reshaping American Politics. Brad Todd is founding partner of At On Message Inc., a leading national Republican opinion research agency. His candidate clients have included seven U.S. senators, five governors, and more than two dozen congressmen. I'm also pleased to welcome our moderator for this conversation. Heather Cox Richardson is a professor of American history at Boston College. Her most recent book is To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party. She is currently working on an intellectual history of American politics and a graphic treatment of the Reconstruction Era. Please join me in welcoming our special guests this evening. Welcome everyone to what seems like it's going to be a great evening of uh, discussion with people who are looking at the current realignment in American politics, uh, how they see that and the future that they see for both Republican and the Democratic parties, especially in the wake of the midterm elections. So we actually have a real treat here because we have not two books to discuss, but three books to discuss because um, John has written two books in the last two years. Apparently he doesn't sleep. Um, so what I'd like to do is to walk through these two books and then The Great Revolt as well, and then to compare what they're talking about and what they have to say about this current moment. So I'd like to start with you, John, and start with your most recent book about nationalism. And I'd like for you to talk to us about what you mean by nationalism, first of all, which is a word we hear a lot now without much of a definition, and then maybe we can explore the dimensions of nationalism. So can you start with what you mean by nationalism in this new book? Sure. The, uh, nice to be here. I know what it feels like to be a rock star now because I can, can't see you. You can see me. <laughs> <laughs> I see some people right in the front there. That's about it. Um, nationalism. Now, you know, nationalism is something that got a, a very bad name after World War II. And um, it, it's also something that's become very, very controversially, controversial recently. Uh, Donald Trump said, I'm a nationalist. Now, w what I, I've tried to do is to uh, rescue, a, to a certain extent, nationalism uh, from, bo from uh, you know, obviously the world memories of World War, War II, and also from some of the uses to which it's been put in American politics over the last 30 or 40 years. And wh what I'd like to say is that, that underlying nationalism is something that you could call a sense of nationality that we all have. Um, you know, some of us um, say, well, I'm cosmopolitan, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but then the Twin Towers get hit by planes, and all of a sudden, you know, if you were me, I was too old, but I, I regretted that I couldn't go 
fight in Afghanistan. Or if you're overseas and you, know, you might be t incredibly critical of your country, but somebody starts running it down. You know, this is a terrible racist club. And all of a sudden you feel very defensive. So there is this se important sense that we have of being part of a nation. And it's extremely important for our politics in two, in two ways. First of all, you can't have a democracy unless you have this sense of nationality. Because what a democracy involves is you're letting somebody who you never will see, who you don't know, who lives a thousand miles away, have an equal vote in who's going to be the president of the United States, who's going to be in the White, who's going to be in Congress. So, you know, again, if you don't have this confidence that you're all part of one nation, it doesn't work. The welfare state, and I don't mean just people on welfare, I mean all kinds of things, social security, unemployment compensation, or in building highways, you're paying taxes. When you pay taxes, you have to believe that it's worth your while to pay these taxes, even though, let's say, they'll go to somebody who is disabled in Reno, Nevada, that you'll never see or that they'll go to build a highway in the state of Washington that you'll never, never travel on. But it's part of being an American and of being part of some nation. So again, th that's this very basic sense of nationality. So I've tried to rescue that. Uh, all right, so wait a minute. I, I want to come back to nationality, but just for a second. How is what you're saying different than patriotism? You got nationalism. How is that different than patriotism? Well, patriotism is more a kind of a subset of nationalism. Patriotism <coughs> is the flag. It's not necessarily what you think about, again, when you're paying taxes. Okay. It's not this kind of unconscious sense of being part of a nation, of being, oh, when we use the word we, that's the key, we Americans. Now, uh, again, uh, there's, a, there's there, there are distinctions here. When we're in politics, we, make, we, we try to say that what we're doing is in the national interest. If you can show that something isn't in the national interest, that's a good way to kill it as legislation. So that's a, just a, another level. Then beyond that, what you have sometimes in history are nationalist movements, candidates, parties, uh, who, that are based on a kind of us versus them distinction. We Americans versus somebody else. We French versus somebody else. America first, France first, Italy first. Those can be, again, left, right, or center. Lincoln was a nationalist in that sense. Uh, Churchill, de Gaulle, but also Donald Trump, also Mussolini, also Hitler. Again, left, center, right, it can go in all kinds of different directions. And, you know, again, the question for, for me isn't whether nationalism is good, but what use are we making of this common sense of our all being part of one nation? But of course, nationalism is a new concept in Western history. It comes largely after the French Revolution when nations start to see themselves as nation states as opposed to organizations based on religion, ethnicity, um, or even necessarily borderlands. Is this uh, significant for the moment, for the present moment? Is it significant that we have this, that this national is a, this is a fairly uh, state new... of nationalist movements? Uh, sure, that's the. I mean, the the big political question now. I mean, you can do it in terms of populism too. Is why in the last 20, 30 years we've had this spate of nationalist movements, mostly but not exclusively on the right. The United States, you know, again Ross Perot, who was more center left, Buchanan, Tea Party, Trump. Etc. All, and in Europe, even you know, even more so. Um, again, he, and and come and in countries that you would never expect it, uh, like Sweden or Denmark, very powerful na nationalist movement. So again, the question is, why now? Why in this particular period we've had all these movements? And those new movements recently tend to have been coming largely from the right, the nationalist movements. Right. All right, so you mentioned another word that I think we need to get to before we get into the Great Revolt, and that's, pop, that's the word populism, which is your last book two years uh -huh. ago. How did you write two books in two years, by the way? Well, Inquiring minds want to know. They're short books, and um, <laughs> may, let's say three years, and the populism one I'd been writing in my mind 
since the early 90s. The nationalism one, I had to figure some things out. Oh, so that's the answer. You just write it in your mind for, yeah. for <laughs> 25 years first. Right? right. OK, so there you know. Um, all right, populism. Define populism for us. Well, populism, again, is like nationalism. There is no definition. You know, you talk to <laughs> political you scientists, so and they want to be scientists, so they have a, a formula. But, you know, again, if you go back in the way the, the term is used, like any Republican who cares about anybody other than business, like Jack Kemp, for instance, has been described as a populist. I, Putin has been described as a populist because he goes ar around without his shirt. You know, you've seen these photos. of. So, again, I, th I think what, what we're looking for, again, is a populist political tradition. And that tradition I locate uh, as beginning in the United States in the 1890s, in the early 1890s. And that's where the, the name itself comes from. And the most basic thing you could say about populism is it's based upon a kind of uh, this, uh, <coughs> dyadic, if you want to use a fancy term, distinction between the people and the establishment, or the people and the elites, two terms. And there's the idea that they are in a kind of irresolvable conflict. And there's populism on the, both the left and on the right. The original populists in America in the 1890s were much more on the left. Uh, you know, then you get, uh, you, you get uh, Father Coughlin in the 1930s. You get Pat Buchanan. Uh, you get, again, go all the way up to Donald Trump's campaign in 2016, much more on the right. And I, I think the distinction I'd make is that the left-wing kinds of populism are much simpler. There's only two terms. You think about Occupy Wall Street, the 99% versus the 1%. All there are is, that a, is, a, is the, are the people and the elite. What you find uh, with conservatives and the right is that usually there's another term. There's the idea that the elite or the establishment is coddling a third group. It can be illegal immigrants in the case of, uh, of Trump. It can be Muslims. It can be uh, African Americans. In, Fran you know, in France, it's Muslims uh, that enters into the picture. But both are populist. And the, the odd thing, about, again, about, uh, about the so-called right-wing populist is that <coughs> often on domestic issues, uh, they're very much on the left and the center. Donald Trump's campaign in uh, 2016 was attacking corporations uh, for moving uh, their factories to Mexico. So, you know, same thing you would hear from Bernie Sanders or 20 years before that from, uh, from uh, Dick, Dick Gephardt. Uh, the French uh, populace, their, their, ver their view of uh, national health insurance is that it not only should cover everybody, but that it should be very careful to give everybody equal treatment. So again, that's the kind of oddity about the right-wing version of, of populism. Then on a lot of domestic issues, you know, there's... So this is exactly where I was hoping you would go. ...in which we are currently looking at the rise of populism on both the right and the left in America, according to your argument in your populist book. Right. Right? Right. Which brings us to you people. I think Donald, the populism of Donald Trump and as the re Republican, Donald Trump is a product of the realignment, not the creation of the time. Uh, it's, a, it's really classic in that it, his populism is very much, you know, our, our book surveyed Trump voters in the five Great Lakes states that flipped. Uh, we asked them to rank four key campaign promises that Donald Trump had made, which one was the most important to them. Uh, the, the illegal immigration issue was fourth. Only 7% no, said seven that was his most important campaign issue. Today. Tell us about your methodology. How did you get to that? It's, an, it's a survey of, uh, Donald, of Trump voters, 400 Trump voters. Self-screened. Combination depending on this, the quality of the panel uh, in, in each place. So self election. So, so panel studies are, are excellent at identifying a known group that already is glad to say what it is. Tell their friends and neighbors they voted for Trump, interestingly <laughs> enough. Uh, but back to the populist point, the the fact that Trump to them, then the, then then the question on this coalition has moved, uh, and I think nationalism. You're bringing nationalism. In this sense, nationalism is the opposite of multinationalism, uh, and, and many ways. And in the 16 election, you saw against 
TPP, the latest multinational trade agreement. You saw Rob Portman, who'd been a former U.S. trade representative. He campaigned against it. You saw Pat Toomey, who used to be the enforcer of trade agreements on the Republican side, the clever growth. He campaigned against it. Trump proudly said nationalist. And so I, I think this should really be best understood today, not in its that came out of alliances that no longer are would, valid. Would you, right. Yeah, I... <laughs> I agree with the immigration thing out of my experience. You know, in my first book, in the populism bo book, I really did stress the economics thing, and I felt uh, guilty about it afterwards because I had to admit that the things that made people most passionate was was the illegal immigration. Now, I don't, you know, you can't settle this, but I'm just saying that it's not. Uh, uh, well, your it, book both were both were important, but but uh, in ter in terms of the nationalism and globalization, um, again, I think there's a lot of truth in what in in the Trump Bannon position on uh, that we've had an economy where we really have let. Um, the free market internationally dictate what happens in our own country. And as a result of that, China being led into the WTO, we've had this enormous, enormous loss of manufacturing jobs. GNTR, was it? The, 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 the problem <coughs> I see with the Trump version of nationalism is not nationalism versus globalization economically, but nationalism versus internationalism, meaning that there are some problems in the world like uh, climate change, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, you know, you name it, there's a bunch of them, where you really do have to cede part of your sovereignty to some kind of international cooperation. And that, that's, I think, that's where I'm very uncomfortable with Trump's version of nationalism, because I think, again, it's not just anti-globalism, but it's anti-internationalism. Why do you think people reacted so badly when Trump called himself a nationalist the other day? Well, I didn't see how people reacted to it. I think I've been on the road too mm. much. Um, but I, I, well, I do want to speak to uh, about nationalism in that it, it, in the Great Revolt, uh, we, I went to all the, the five Great Lakes states uh, that Brad talked about, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Iowa. And in talking to people, it, the conversation's a little more nuanced about nationalism. And, and for a lot of people, it isn't nationalistic, it's localism. So anybody here ever go to Whole Foods? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Um, when you go to Whole Foods and you see that beautiful red tomato that was grown five yards from where you're staying, aren't you really proud to buy it? Because it's from your local area, right? And, and think about when you go to a farm-to-table place, right? Oh, my God, you're getting something that came from the farm that's, you know, down the street, and you're eating it. That's localism, right, for you. For a lot of Trump voters, um, their communities uh, are, are falling apart. And, but they have great pride in that, in that community. It's where their father's father's father made, settled the family. And it's that they want the same sort of lifestyle for their children and their grandchildren. And that localism is often confused with nationalism. Brad, in our book, we ask people about, in, in the survey, we ask people um, how they felt about their personal lives. And what was that number? 84% of the Trump voters are optimistic about their own personal financial situation, self-reported. Again, again, and and I, I think it was often uh, you know, every profile that most newspaper writers wrote of Trump voters was they're all, you know, out of work in a rusted out steel mill town, strung out on heroin, uh, and, you know, mad at the world. Uh, when, it, when in fact, they, they were very optimistic about their personal financial situation, scared to death about their communities. Uh, yeah. one, of the, one of the ten communities we focus on, and we, we list six, six archetypes of Trump voters, seven archetypes of Trump voters, and went to ten counties uh, that flipped from Obama to Trump to find these voters. Uh, one of those counties, Ashtabula, Ohio, has about 90,000 people. In 1970, Ashtabula <coughs> County, Ohio, had about 90,000 people. Uh, you can still see where the people used to work that were the you know, hulking, rusted out uh, industrial places, and then you go meet them and figure out the three jobs they're doing to make up for it now. Uh, and 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 it's um, uh, I, I think that that sort of juxtaposition of optimism, personally, and 
fear uh, about the larger thing, I think, colors a lot of and is misunderstood. Interestingly enough, when you describe the populist moment that you believe we're in, it read to me as if you were describing it as a very economic populist moment. Is that a fair assumption in your populist book? That's fair, but I've somewhat moved away from that in the next book. In the book. next book, yes, yeah. and I think you needed to. Yours, by contrast, and, and I'll, I, I'm not going to leave that there. Don't worry. I'm <laughs> setting it up. We're just going to um, leave it right there. <laughs> and, um, yours, by contrast, focuses on economics and on self-reported uh, <coughs> motivations of Trump voters. But it read to me much more a cultural look at, the, at this populist moment. Is that fair? Well, certainly culture is what animates the discussion now. Uh, Trump himself will tell you. you know, he went to a rally in West Virginia for the Senate race there earlier, and his talking points were all about the tax cut. And he <coughs> handed them back to the aide and says, this stuff's boring. Uh, you know, let's talk about something else, you know, culture. And we but are, what does that say about the fact well, that your people self-report that they care about economics more than well, anything else? Well, he may else. not read his audience correctly. Yeah. First Trump? Yeah. And, really and, and next, an artist, next, an audience. Well, let's, let's, let's peel it back one time. And I think often with Trump, it's important to take Trump out of the equation. We've never had a more polarizing political figure, and none of us, no matter how intellectual we are, can get away from our own personal gut visceral reaction, positively or negatively. So I always tell people, imagine the 2016 election worked out exactly as it did, but the person who won is not named Donald Trump. Now let's evaluate everything else. Uh, and of course, political scientists tell us we were in the fifth party system, right? That the United States party system is realigned four times. This is the fifth party system that began with the election of Franklin Roosevelt, the first presidential election of the Great Depression. There's been some argument whether we're out of it. I'm sure you have an opinion whether we're out of fifth or not. I don't think the fifth ended with Donald Trump. I think it ended with Barack Obama. It was Barack Obama who decided not to campaign on his version of the New Deal, the Fair Deal, you know, the Great Society, right? Every Democrat has been running on the same thing forever until Barack Obama. And he had a piece of the, a new New Deal, if you will, with the Amer Affordable Care Act. His 20, you can't find advertising in his 2012 campaign about the Affordable Care Act. It's not there. He campaigned on birth control. He campaigned on Roe v. Wade. He campaigned on cultural issues. And it was Obama who, with the, with the biggest piece of the Great Society New Deal in 50 years, chose not to run on it. And I think Obama sort of recognized that the realignment had happened, and he chose to move the campaign debate over to culture. So Trump was an obvious reaction, and culture does animate the discussions. But I think to ignore the fact that the Republican coalition has changed and that you now have Republican senators willing to be, and a Republican president willing to be very critical of, of leading corporations in America is very different. We went for 50 years, 75 years, where every race was Franklin Roosevelt against Barry Goldwater, right? Franklin Roosevelt is the government will e equalize your economic equality, and Barry Goldwater is laissez faire, best of luck to you. Uh, and, and Republicans <laughs> defended that, and for every Republican defended it, until now. And I think when you have a president of the United States, we stand up willing to shame Ford, shame Carrier, shame any large corporation that outsources, that is a big deal. And you don't see other Republican senators rushing to Carrier's defense. And I think so, that, wait, wait, oh, wait, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. On, the, on Obama in 2012, um, I, I believe exactly the opposite, I think that um, the what happened was Obama really uh, chickened out in the summer of 2011 on the sequester and the budget debate. And he, re he really had a moment there when he saw that his coalition that his, that was falling apart. Now, the fall was Occupy Wall Street. December, so he gives a speech at o Osawatomie where he goes back to Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, and in the campaign itself, uh, economics was extraordinarily important. And Bill Clinton's role was key. Ohio, Michigan, we saved the auto jobs. That was, you know, again, that was the key appeal. Now, in 2016 <coughs> and 2018, I think that, that the, the cu cultural issues have been much more elevated. But a lot of Obama's pitch, when I heard him, was, re was about economics. That's when you heard him. That's not when, when well, voters, that's not what voters heard. I would. It was Mitt Romney's the guy who take your jobs away. He ran against Romney as Goldwater. I think he ran the economic campaign in the negative. He didn't run it in the positive. I mean, if you, in the well, Washington. So it doesn't matter. It still was an economic campaign. And that was the whole idea 
that that uh, Romney was going to take was going to take their jobs away. He was a rich guy. He didn't care about uh, or ordinary people. All you know was the 47 percent stuff. So I, I'm just saying. I mean, I don't know how relevant this is to the whole discussion that 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 Obama campaign in 2012 was very much centered on economics. Hillary Clinton in 2016 was not centered in, in economics, much more on identity politics and, you know, again, on I'm with her, uh, the idea of electing a woman. So uh, I, think, I think one of the most interesting things that's happening that we don't talk about a lot is that today's modern po populism, at least the way that we saw it when we were writing the book, is, is, a, a, is a healthy skepticism against all things big. And it's in both parties. It's not just in the Republican Party. And we've all been paying attention to the Republican Party because Donald Trump wakes up every morning and throws a Molotov cocktail out there. And we all run to see, either run to it or run away from it. But we haven't been paying attention to the, 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 the Democrats are in the exact same place. And they have the same sort of sentiments. I mean, to the left, but it's still that sort of skepticism of all these, you know, big things, big media, big, um, they don't like the press as much as Republicans don't like, like my profession. I think that, that, that the, now that they have taken power in the House and will have more sort of air time in, in, in not only on television, but in policy, I think we'll see more uh, evidence of that and, and, and how that's impacting their party as well. Well, I want to get go move forward here, but I still think we have to come back to what I still see as a difference in that both of you have identified, you in your populist book, not so much in the nationalist book, the new one, and you in the Great Revolt have identified this populist moment as basically uh, characterized you by economics and you with a cultural difference articulated in economics. Let me see is if that, I can it's, explain it's, I the, the, how the connection between the two, because that's what really what... <coughs> what I tried to do in the, in the second book. If, if you look at the, the people who've been most affected by globalization, again, by this kind of new, new economy that arises in the 90s, you get incredible prosperity, growth, metropolitan centers, Boston, for instance, San Francisco, where I live in Washington. Uh, at the same time, you get uh, a, a lot of loss of manufacturing, mining jobs. Uh, you get a lot of small towns and medium-sized towns where people are not necessarily poor. They have jobs, but they feel, again, the British use this term, left behind. And left behind uh, has a cultural as well as an economic meeting, but it's grounded in something in economics and what's happened over the last 20 and 25 and 30 years. And a lot of it does manifest itself in, in a, an idea that people have about what it is to be an American. Uh, again, it's lo localism, but it's also traditional family. Guns are very important. I did my own little focus group when I did in Ohio in a suburb of an industrial town. And I was amazed how much, much people talked about guns. And I realized that it wasn't the matter, it was only uh, one of the people was actually a hunter, but it was protecting the home. Again, a much more of a traditional way of life, a, much, a, a kind of identity much more centered, again, on what it is to be American. Very offended by uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, kneeling uh, and people following that in the, in the National Football League. So uh, again, I think it's a combination, and, and what I tried to capture it is people feeling a threat to, a, to their way of life. But the people who feel that are generally people who, again, have been left behind by this economic process that's going on. So again, you identify that they are feeling left behind because of their economic, be, being left in the economic backwash after 1981. Right. Right. So what, is, what I want to push on here, and obviously I'm going somewhere here, to all three of you, is what's missing in your books. So you, they're upset because they're upset about Colin Kaepernick. Your people are upset at one point because Obama apologized for so much, that you know, they see him as a real apologist all the time. Um, apologizer, not apologist. 
where do you put the media in this? The media does not appear in your books as any kind of a driver of culture or perceptions of economic change. And I think we kind of have to throw it on the table when you talk about the rise of populism, because after all, that's what populists do is they manage to monopolize the, the media system I, I think in history, not we, just today. The media. We, we, oh, do, we do talk about the media in yeah. one sense in that we call Donald Trump the first smartphone president. Uh, he will not be the last smartphone president. There will only be smartphone presidents for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, he, he, he won despite the entire Republican hierarchy, every Republican donor, almost every Republican elected official against him because he could directly go to the public. But in many, much the same way that newspapers and, and television stations have, are, have lost credibility for the, in the, through the exact same mechanism. All of us can sort our own news. You know, Edelman is a study we have quoted in the book, 80-something percent of Americans only read news they agree with. And they view all news as perspective. And so I think that sort of that the media's role is in, in becoming a bogeyman for both sides uh, is, is you have to view it as that's another vestige of the sort of the fragmentation yielded uh, in, the, in the digital era. But how do you square that with the idea that they have legitimate economic concerns and yet they articulate, are articulating them in cultural fashions that they are getting from a, from a media that you're saying they don't trust? There's a, there's a square here that doesn't circle. Well, no, it's centralized power. It's centralized power. Te the tech industry, the media, and with, that's, a, that's how this populist movement differs from, from those before that John has studied and, and, and articulated is that in prior iterations of populism in America, it was all an opposition to centralized economic power, the bankers, free silver movement, right? And now it is not just an opposition to centralized economic power, it's centralized control of information. It's centralized control of entertainment. It is a, it is a movement against curating. Uh, and and that's, a, that's, a, that's a movement that goes beyond how we feel in politics. Uh, when all of us were children, the number one department store in the, in the world was Sears. Sears had one brand of everything, right? You buy a dishwasher, it's a Kenmore. You buy a tool, it's a Craftsman. Wait, stop. People <laughs> sharing memes to the, in the millions on Facebook are fighting against a centralized power? I, the, Facebook is not popular as a centralized entity. It's a platform you're forced to use, but Facebook itself is just as unpopular as ABC and CNN. But those memes that they're sharing were not economic. Sure, sure there, there are economic ones, there are not, but fa the, the resentment is over centralized <coughs> control of, of your life. It's no different it's than the populist movement before. I would, uh, I, I would get you off this media thing a little. Um, I, let me say something, so I'm not saying odd. You know, you, you couldn't have had modern capitalism or democracy without the printing press. What's that, 15th, <coughs> 15th century? Uh, the internet brings the same kind of possibilities expanded. You get a whole, you get a whole world of democracy that a possibility of democracy that just didn't exist before. Um, you know, I used to be a uh, report on trade stuff in the 1980s, and there were like 10 people in the United States that knew about the omnibus trade bill. Now, you know. Anybody can look up this stuff on the internet, and indeed a lot of people do. So it gives this possibility of democratization. Uh, Ross Perot was the first person to understand it, with the idea that you know you could use the internet to, to vote, uh, to have mm -hmm. plebiscites. I'm, I'm not endorsing that idea, but again, it's, it, and, but, but what it does also, it speeds things up and accelerates and dr dr dramatizes things. Uh, I, you know, I mean, we, we've had these kind of incredible populist, nationalist upsurges and battles before in history. I mean, the 1920s, I'm sorry, in Europe, you know. So it's not unusual. I, and I, I would get away from just blaming the media or well, using it as the, you know, as using it as the, the key person. I'm not blaming the media, but I think you have to have a mediator between what's happening in the economic world and the way people perceive what's happening in the economic world. And it seems to me that mediator is the media. It, it, well, it, the I public mean, doesn't buy that. No, the public doesn't want that anymore. As someone in the media, I would know. <laughs> so you think that, so what you're saying then is that people on the street in Ashtabula, Ohio, are reading the economic reports and deciding they're doing that their localism is falling it, apart it's, because it's of not you have to give them more credit. Right. You have to you have to give them credit that, that this is the most. There, we've never had a time in which Americans were more engaged in public debate about 
what's happening with their government. So they're not getting their information. So well, had the highest from, midterm turnout since 2014. So they're not getting their information from Facebook. They're getting their information from well, where? Actually, the number one source for New York Times readers is Facebook. More New York Times, that's in our book. More New York Times stories are read on Facebook than are read on NewYorkTimes.com. I, I know that. So what I'm suggesting is that you, where people are getting their information matters in the rise of populism. At least it always has historically. Right. But, but look, it's it not a blaming it, thing. The it's information a can consist just of this. Uh, my, uh, and I'm using my for somebody else, uh, I worked at General Motors for 20 years. My father worked there. But now it's leaving, and what are my kids going to do? Sears Roebuck just went out of business. Used to be, you know, they used to, mm -hmm. used to work for Sears. You'd have a special outfit, benefits for life. That's an economic fact, and that's something people don't necessarily need. Facebook, that's the kind of reality uh, on which this, uh, on which this kind of unhappiness is grounded. What I'm pushing, I, I actually agree that we are in a populist moment yeah. and that it is informed by an economic, major economic dislocation that has been in the works now since at least 1981. Every statistic says that's the case. But I do not understand how you look at the rise of the populist moment right now without looking at the role of the media. And the other thing that's missing, at least from your first book, not your second, and missing from your book, and that's racism and sexism. I just don't see how you do it. Well, what is the, I mean, the media is, is a medium. And exactly. But, but I and think you're turning it, it into an agent that invents something that isn't there before. I mean, the, uh, again, it magnifies, dramatizes, but the conflicts over the family, over race and stuff like that exist, again, on the ground. It's not like, it's not like they're invented by the media. I'm you, not understanding what you're yeah, getting at. You don't think that those things have been magnified by, for example, micro-targeting uh, of people on Facebook? We've never had a time when people could seek out more things on their own. I think I just reject your notion that people That's are That's not true. The 1890s is very, very are, similar are, to are, this. Are spoon-fed things by people who are leading them around by the nose. I just reject it. It's not, what, it's not my experience. Just that people end up reading things they agree with, but they sort through a lot of other stuff to get there. And I just, I think people, you had, if you look in Ohio, you had 30-something counties in Ohio swing 25 points or more between 2012 and 20, I mean, 26, 2012 and 2016. That's not a bunch of people who've just been led around by the nose. Voting for Obama and Donald Trump are two very different things. Ashtabula swung 31 points. I, I'm not arguing that at all. I'm actually really interested in this. And don't misunderstand where I'm coming from. I am looking at this as a logical problem. And I do not see how you can talk about the rise of this current very populist moment while you also dismiss the fact that we do have widespread both racist and sexist memes that are now widely popularly acceptable in amongst many of the populist supporters of these movements. How can you, are you saying that, that those things don't matter? Racism and sexism are no more accepted now than they've ever been, no more common than they've ever been. They're just it's part of humanity. It's, it's, it's. All right, actually, let's take that though. Um, I think we could argue that. For example, there have been 17 cases in, since Donald Trump was elected in which people accused of hate crimes, their, prosecu uh, their defenders uh, defended them by saying that they were simply echoing the language of the president, which was not the case under either Barack Obama or George W. Bush, which as far back as the study is gone. But. I'm actually fine with that. You guys can ask questions about that because this question of populism and how you realign American democracy seems to me to be absolutely central to the fact we are in a new realignment. Good question. And so I see a logical problem here without taking into consideration our new media and the way it's being packaged not simply the way people take and, and get information, but simply how it's being sold, et cetera. But the other problem is what is being sold over that media, and I think those have to be taken into consideration. That being said, you both of you, are, you two groups, are on a project to try and reimagine two different political parties. 
and I think probably we are at the time when we should talk about how either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party can take this populism and move it forward, especially in light of the 2018 elections, which both of which you were writing before they happened. Uh, I mean, if you look at the results of 2018 election, midterm elections, it was the highest turnout for a midterm. Um, you had a record number of women and people of color to win. Uh, so if, I don't think it's a bad thing, right? If that's, what, thing. if that's what populism brings us, then that's a good thing. You know, I mean, I don't know what else to say about that. I, I, I think the question, the realignment leaves a, a third group with a not an easy home. And that's people who live in high education density suburbs. They typically are wealthier, they're not necessarily wealthier, but they're high education density. Uh, if you look at the 2016 election, the biggest predictor of how a locality voted was not the education, or how a person in a locality voted was not their own education, but the, lo but the education of their neighbors. Donald Trump lost college graduates in, co in high density, high education density counties by about 18 points. He won college graduates in locations with below average college education. So their own status as a, as a degree holder did, didn't matter as much. But there's, he ran consistently seven to nine points behind Mitt Romney's number in those highly educated suburban counties. This year, in the midterm election, where you saw the Democrats' gains were almost all in those high education density suburban counties. Those voters are no, not comfortable with where the Democrat Party's positions on ideology is, where their positions are, or for their positions on taxes, or even the foreign relations on national security, but they're very uncomfortable with Donald Trump's rhetoric. And so the test as we move forward, and all realignments, they're like continental drift. They keep moving slowly and slowly, and it, you know, the, the, the plates drag on each other. The question going forward is which party will accurately find those voters a home? Because I think the economic populace, the Democrats have written off. But, but didn't Donald Trump lose badly in the Rust Belt? In, in, I'm sorry, not Donald Trump, he wasn't on the ticket. In the 2018 midterm elections, didn't the Republicans lose badly, with the exception of Ohio, which is a different state, in the Rust Belt, which will force the Republicans to double down on the rhetoric that caught them the Deep South, well, which tends it, to be know, racist and sexist? Most of the losses in the, in, the, in the Great Lakes region were due to very underfunded Republican candidates. John James and in, Michi ones. in Michigan got, got only, Debbie Stabenow got 53%, of, a fairly low percentage against a guy who had no money. Uh, Sherrod Brown in Ohio barely wins against Jim Renacci, a guy who had no money. Uh, in Minnesota, what would have been, a, could have been a close race, the Republican again had no money. I think that that's a little bit of an overwritten story that the Donald Trump's, the Republicans lost in the Great Lakes states. The resources weren't there. Democrats had a massive money advantage this time, probably the, the first time in our, in our lives. And I think it, may, it played out just by, by sheer sort of almost coincidence by who emerged in the primaries and that's where it played now out. Now, you've written about why you think Ohio is a good sign for the Republicans. Well, I mean, I think in an it's a, <coughs> not in the book, in, a, in an article. Yeah, uh, so recently, if you took a look at the results in Ohio, it's, I, I, well, I think it's a good example of the realignment, more so than good for Republicans, in that you saw Mahoning County, where Youngstown, Ohio is located, right, hasn't voted for a Republican um, since the 1920s, since, since FDR, the county itself. Didn't vote for Donald Trump in, in, um, in 2016, but it did swing 27 points. It was this close. Hillary Clinton still won. But you saw Mahoning County send uh, two Republicans to the state house, first time ever. You go over to Franklin County, um, which is where Columbus, Ohio is, the state capital. And if you look at the northern tier of Franklin County, that's always been reliable, suburban, Republican territory. It sent home all the Republican um, people from the state house. So I think Ohio is a really great example of that realignment. And as, as, as you pointed out, Sherrod Brown, uh, four weeks before the election, he was winning the uh, Ohio by 19 percentage points. Um, two weeks before, he was winning by nine percentage points. He only won what by happened? six. What happened? Where did this lead go? Well. He, the, the, the state has shifted. There's a ceiling for Democrats yeah. in the Great Lakes now. They, it, you, you, you see so that. So do we have to talk at all about the mechanics of voting recently? <coughs> What's your, what, do you, what do you mean? Well, again, I'm, I, study, <laughs> I study politics, and, and I listen to something like that, and I say either our polling is, is desperately wrong 
or there are mechanical <coughs> reasons that make it difficult to predict how, how places are going to vote because, you know, maybe certain people can't get to the polls. Heather, I'm or, still uh, stuck with the media here. I'm sorry? <laughs> with your point about the media. I just don't get it. Look, in it's the not 1950s, an attack on the media. It's, in the it's, 1950s, we had the White Citizens Council. Yeah. You had, I mean, talk about memes. I mean, there was the assumption that blacks were inferior. It wasn't just the, I mean, it, you know, we even went beyond the, what's called the alt-right now. Um, you had viol incredible violence, way beyond what we have now. Uh, a lot of what's going on and what you're pointing to, again, has uh, been instigated by Trump's kind of campaigning and talk. And I expect that Americans are going to repudiate that. I do not believe that uh, it's going to survive in 2020. Maybe I'm wrong. The coalition, I'm not saying the coalition doesn't exist, but that kind of uh, incitement. So I'm not, I, again, I just don't see it. I, I mean, I think you're making the media too much an agent for this and not uh, social processes, which, you know, go on periodically in American history. So uh, the... A couple of things that, that is maybe more than anybody wants to hear. Um, I, I do think that ideas were packaged very differently in 2016 at a different scale than they have been, uh -huh. um, you know, since Stanton put it all together with CBS way back in the 1950s, right. and which was a deliberate attempt to package people and to sell them and to make them do certain things to turn them into a commercial commodity. And that was done in, the, in 2016 in a way that we could, had never foreseen before because of the ability to micro-target large audiences and say, I can convince somebody to vote this way if I do this. I think we're in the Wild West of how you micro-target audiences through media. Well, but, but and that's a process. That's not, that's not a criticism. I, I, that's I know, just but that's happens. an ongoing process. And I, I believe in, in the <coughs> future really there is going to be some kind of regulation of that. That's what the whole fight about Facebook is about. Right. So, yes, it but did, do you really it did think accelerate that things. It made things worse, but, but it also made things better. I mean, we also, again, I agree that the people, the level of knowledge and participation that we have in this country now, uh, we haven't had for many years. And a lot of that is, I'm sorry, you know. It's economic. Is, well, it's a result of, the, again, of the internet and what it, the possibilities that it live? creates. Are we, are, how are we doing? Okay. Um, Do questions. Well, uh, <laughs> we could argue about this. Oh, look. This one says I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I could tell by all those people applauding every, every time. You... Um, okay. We got some great questions here. Uh, to what extent do, do populists in the United States you told me I was going to read questions, I would have brought different glasses. Um, to what extent do populists in, the, in America and Europe make common cause? To what, uh, to what uh, do they go to conferences, summits, and do they share resources? Great question. Thank you. To what extent do you... Populists in the U.S. and Europe make common cause? I can, I can answer cause? that factually. Great. Yeah. Um, uh, Steve Bannon has started this thing, what is called the movement in... Uh, in uh, Europe to uh, bring together a lot of the right-wing populist governments and uh, parties. Uh, the League in, uh, in Italy, uh, Orban in uh, Hungary, I think those are his main people. The uh, Marine Le Pen's national rally in France, they've been a little skittish. And um, UK, the United Kingdom Independence <coughs> Party is not, doesn't really have any power anymore in uh, London, but he's involved in trying to, to do that. But the, uh, but the thing about it is that a lot of those movements and parties and governments don't agree about things. For instance, the Poles and the hun Hungarians don't agree about Putin at all. So uh, again, I don't, I don't know whether this is going to work. Uh, similar things are happening on the left. Uh, the, uh, there's some kind of cooperation between some of the Sanders people and the Corbyn people, for instance. Um, again, and I think also with Die Linke, the, the left in uh, Germany. So, but on a much low, uh, on a much much lesser level than uh, you would find with the the uh, what Bannon's trying to do. In I, I don't think it will ever happen in the United States because American populists, uh, be they Bernie Sanders types or those on on, on the right, uh, are highly skeptical of any central authority, and that means they're highly skeptical of being organized. 
uh, in, in many ways. Uh, conferences are exactly the opposite thing they seek. They're convinced the conferences are festering of the problem. So uh, I would not expect a whole lot of organization. Populism is a sentiment and attitude in America. It's not, a, it, it, it's not ever going to be a, 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 a organized party. So this is year perfectly, we, we will pay you for setting up this next question. Uh, if Republicans have become suspicious of, big, of bigness, is, uh, of, if Republicans have become suspicious of bigness, that is large corporations, how do you understand their embrace of deregulation? Because big government is another big entity. You well, can't, populism in today in America has expressed the skepticism of all things big. And, and I think that's why it no longer has a home in the Democratic Party, because there are no Democrats who are skeptical of big government. But wait, doesn't that create big business? 84% of Trump's voters in our survey say that he stands up on their behalf against big corporations. That's their belief. Well, look, media, I, media. I, I think you have to you have to make a distinction between Republicans in this case. Well, here I'll put three things: Trump in 2016 in the campaign, which was very much on domestic issues, right. had real left-wing populists. <laughs> He was going to the left most candidate on fifteen. He wasn't. He wasn't going to eat the Oreo cookies because Nabisco was moving from uh, my old hometown of Chicago to Mexico. Um, he was not. He was not going to allow tax havens for corporations uh, that wanted to move to the Cayman Islands for their their headquarters. There were there were all these things. Okay, so that's Trump one. Then Republican two. Republican business. Uh, the, the Republican uh, business Republicanism which is uh, still in command, particularly in the Senate and the House. Uh, and you get the tax bill. Uh, the tax bill uh, is very favorable, cuts corporate tax rates, also cuts co uh, rates on, the, on uh, the wealthy, which Steve Bannon didn't want Trump to do. Trump goes along with that. So, you know, again, you get Trump won 2016, you get the Republicans, which are very business friendly, and you get Trump giving in on certain things and not on others. So I, you know, again, but I think that's corporatism, the, the, that's the, that's what gave rise to the populist movement of Bernie and of Trump, though, is corporatism is now exists in both political parties. Uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act is constructed not as a government health care system, but as an ol a, a protection for the oligopolies of insurance and pharmaceutical companies. Barack Obama's first largest donor by uh, occupation, if you look at all his individual donors, was the University of California system, right? Professors and ministers. His second largest donor is Goldman Sachs. Global corporatism is, 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 is deep in the top of both political parties. So you can't, it, it, that's why you have populists on both wings. Yeah. Um, do Trump supporters and Brexit supporters have some shared values, uh, have the same shared values in the sense of nationalism? It's a great question. Well, great question. Again, I, I, there's, there's a, there are similarities between the <coughs> political bases of both. There's a lot of similarities between uh, Ohio and West Virginia, let's say, and nor Northeast England, where uh, the, these towns that, again, were ma manufacturing and mining towns and beginning in the 1980s were decimated. And that's where, again, that plus a kind of old to uh, Tory traditionalism is what made up the Brexit vote. What about age? You know, the, the age demographic seems to Older. be significant but in both again, of those cases. But that's, again, that's again, that's a matter of who lives in these towns. The kids are all leaving. And, and so, you know, who's left are, to a great extent, older people. The only exception to this, again, is in, in France, for instance, the National Rally gets a lot of young people. And it gets a lot of young people just because it's radical. Because, again, it's, you know, protesting the existing conditions. Uh, alternative for Deutschland in Germany also gets young people. But here and in, in Britain, uh, a, a lot of the young people are flocking uh, to the you know, metropolitan areas and they, to a great extent, tending They're democratic or tending labor. It also depends where you are. I did the Senate race this year in Missouri where Josh Hawley beat Claire McCaskill and Josh Hawley did better with voters under 45 than he did with voters over 70. Not, again, that's not typical from the, of national numbers right now, but it depends on your location. All right, in populism and nationalism, what is the role of alternative facts and fake news as opposed to actual verifiable facts or the truth? Well, it's, a uh, you know, <laughs> again, it's not intrinsic to populism. Um, I, I go back to Ross Perot, whom I like, 
Um, he was a little kooky on certain things, and that got him, you know, out of the. But but it, he did not deal in alternative facts. I don't think Buchanan did either. This is more a product of. Buchanan had in the actually 90s. helped to write in the '90s, maybe, but he actually helped to push that idea when he yeah. was a speechwriter for Barry Goldwater and then for Nixon as well. Well, okay. But the, the you, sense in which the sense in which Trump can say something as a fact that's just con it's different, unverifiable and con easily contradicted is something completely completely new for our politics. Brad, Brad and you ha you have to go back to I mean that I don't want, mean to I don't mean to do this uh, thing is scary but I mean the the Nazis in the twenties were very much into alternative facts. In, the, in a very so a certain kind way. of nationalism relies on alternative facts, but it doesn't have to. Abraham Lincoln did not rely on right, alternative facts. Right, that's what I'm saying. It's so I it's think not, you can't address this yeah. question without getting to the fundamental truth, though, that the last people in America who believe that mainstream news organizations or ideological news organizations are neutral referees are the people who work for them. It's, it's that the left, no, the left nor the right. The, the left says, "Oh, the, the media doesn't ever call Trump out," and the right says. Oh, the, the media always calls Trump out. Like it's, it, the mass of American public, the American public of all education levels, believes everything they read in a newspaper is a perspective, it's opinion, it's something they could take away from it, they can evaluate it on their own. They don't think that there are curators out there, just like they don't have Sears and Roebuck picking their dishwashers and their tools anymore. Does that worry you? No, I think the people having more power and decisions is great. Why, why, why if Does you that believe worry in you, markets, Selena? why would you not? Um, well, I mean, it's, it makes me sad. I, I think part of the problem with, with my profession has been the sort of complete annihilation of local news. You Amen. Know, uh, it, it's, it's really heartbreaking for me. I mean, the, the reason I work for the New York Post and the Washington Examiner is because the newspaper I worked for in Pittsburgh left. I'm a fourth generation news person um, and you know my kids were both in the news industry as well they're not anymore and and I think that that you know I mean you you wake up and you open up your local newspaper and you know that person's name because you see it every day and you trust it when you're dealing with a more oh, national uh, press with people you don't know in cities that you're not from you think well you know maybe they don't see the world all the same way I do Maybe they don't report things in, in the same way that John Smith did in my local newspaper. I don't trust them. They have, I, I have, they have to earn my trust. And I think that's a big part of the problem um, with my profession, is that local connection to your local newspaper is sort of gone. I mean, how many, what, what was the, we have this in the book, right? <laughs> yes, 56,000, I'm gonna be, I'm trying to remember from memory though, 56,000 newsroom employees in 1990. Uh, in America. By 2014, it was 30,000. By 2016, they quit taking the study because they didn't want to know the number. Uh, and, and, and we also now have one national newsroom, Twitter, where every, every reporter knows what every other reporter is so, doing. So I'm, I, I, I'm trying to put these in some kind of an yeah. order so they go somewhere. So here we have, does the average Trump voter read his tweets or does the media simply translate it for them? Great question. I think I saw a stat the other day that says one quarter of all Americans follow him on Twitter. Yeah, a lot of those tweets, the, his followers are not real. Sure, I some know of them are bots, as, within, as are mine. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, one of the of th is, in, interesting things about um, Twitter, and I know this number has changed 32 times in the past hour, probably. There's X amount of people on Twitter, right? I think it was like, uh, of Americans, I think it was like 16% of Americans are on Twitter, and like 40% of those have never even used their Twitter account. So as Brad often says, you know, not all of America is on Twitter, but all, all reporters are on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it's just us talking at each other, sometimes not really nicely either. Um, but it, it skews, I think oh, Twitter also skews perspective. You know, it's not a real world. Um, are, are, how many of you are on Twitter? Who? How no can one. you see anybody? <laughs> I have mom eyes. Mom uh, can children see are not everything. on Twitter. How come you're not on Twitter? Because <laughs> she's smart. <laughs> so wait, show your hands again. Mm -hmm. How many are on Twitter? Is that where you get your news from as well? 
<laughs> or do you just go they're on at the, the B Kennedy Library? They really, they, 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 that's not where they do it. Do another question. <laughs> so uh, this raises an, another question here. What is the role of technology in building populism? Would this populist trend be an issue if the internet did not exist? I think that. I, I think it's, I think it's totally the, the populism movement would still be there, although be, it certainly it's empowered us. To, if, again, you have to stay <coughs> out of It empowers us to all pick whatever dishwasher we want. Amazon's now Sears. Amazon doesn't care what dishwasher you want. They'll have it at your house in four days, no matter where you want it. Sears insisted you get um, Yeah, but so, they're not going to deliver a hula hoop instead of, the, instead of the Kenmore. I mean, that's... Correct. But, perceive, but I trust you to decide if it's a hula hoop <coughs> or a Kenmore. Interesting. Um, I will say historically populist moments tend to rise when you have new technologies, new media technologies, because the old gatekeepers get washed away. Well, and that this is, this is, uh, this is not, neither bad nor good, it just is. And the, the, old, the original populist movement that you cited came about because uh, there was obviously economic discontent, but also because there were new uh, newspaper technologies and there were brand new newspapers all over the West that nobody now remembers that transmitted a whole bunch of new ideas that nobody, nobody in the East Coast even knew it was happening. They were blindsided in the 1890 election, well, blindsided. Well, the, the interesting thing I think about the 1890s, I've, I've also studied it. You know, before the 1896 election, which was between um, William McKinley and... Um, William Jennings Bryan, you had these big swing wave elections where like a hundred seats flipped back and forth party power. And, and in between then you had a technological or an industrial revolution. And you also had the great panic of 1893, which was equivalent to our sort of great recession that you had in, in 2008. So you're right, technology does play a big role in, in, um, in how we are impacted. In the 1890s, it was newspapers, all kinds of newspapers, community newspapers, and you know, neighborhood newspapers, and town newspapers, and we have the equivalent now, only it's in our hand. It's, you know, we, we can just look at any, any newspaper we want across the world. What about the 1930s? <coughs> 1930s, you get Huey Long, Father Coughlin, Townsend in California, what, what did that have to do with new media? You know the answer to that. What how, is it? How did, how did uh, Father <laughs> Coughlin get his message across? Radio. Radio. There you go. He does it with okay, radio. So there you and, go. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I don't think, you, Huey Long used radio some, mm -hmm. but not, it wasn't. He used radio it. some. Huey Long um, was famous for a lot of other antics that got him in the newspapers right. a lot. His crazy clothes, his, his big yeah. speeches and all that. I will say the largest midterm election switch in American history is 1894. The presidential elections in those years were actually not big sweeps at all. They were extremely close. Uh, Garfield yeah. wins in 1880 with only about 7,000 votes total. Well, I always think that House elections are more reflective of who we are. Yeah, House because elections they, are important. Because those are the people that are closest to, to us. Next All right, question. so speaking of which, uh, please comment on this observation. Populism from the left and the right is a reaction to neoliberalism and the inequality it delivers. Do you need it again? You know, you, this is, this well, is all over your last book. Again, <coughs> I, I wouldn't go crazy with, with inequality itself, with the fact that some people are rich and some people are poor. I, I think, again, more in, in, it's the uneven development that's occurred in our country. And on the one hand, you get the, again, you get the left behind, small towns, you get Muncie, Indiana, places like that. On the other hand, you get these new metro centers and you get a tremendous churning of jobs. You get kids who are over-credentialed, who go to college and they don't uh, necessarily uh, uh, the, what the, their degrees don't necessarily lead to the kind of jobs they, they, that they should. They uh, they have great student debt. So you get a you get in both these kind of uh, ways. You get on the one hand you get the right, and on the other hand the left. You get Trump. You get Sanders. Uh, very similar thing is happening in uh, Great Britain with uh, you know Corbyn's uh, base. Is the, they've had like three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand people come into the Labor Party, and a lot of them are kids. 
But, you know? but is it not significant that we have such an incredible disparity between the people at the top of the economic scale and the bottom now? We're at one of the greatest I, periods I of inequality in American I think people get upset history. by that, but it's mainly... Um, <laughs> I think they get upset uh, by no, it, No, 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 I know, but I, I, I just, uh, I do not believe that, <laughs> unless people see that there's a connection between inequality and their own condition, they don't necessarily get, get upset about it. So that happens at certain times. But people, if you think about the late 90s, that was an incredible <coughs> boom period. That's when we had these zillionaires start. But you know, it wasn't, uh, again, that wasn't a period where people were that upset about there was prosperity, 3%. So again, I don't think that that's, I think that's mo not mainly the way that- It's not extremes, it's what you're saying. Huh? It's not extremes, it's the comparison. Yes, yes. Okay, all right. The terms populist and progressive tend to be used to mean different things to different people at different times. How would you distinguish between the two, populist and progressive? Another great question. There, there is no way. I mean, it's again, uh, don't, d again, y you know, the terms are, terms are useful uh, in the sense that, that, they, uh, that, that you can d devise theories that, um, that reply, that rely on how we ordinarily use them. And populism is one of them, progressive is another. But you, you, know, you could argue that, uh, that uh, somebody, I mean, Bernie Sanders said that he was a progressive during the uh, 2016 campaign. He didn't like the term populist or, or socialist. But you know, according to my view of populism, which is, again, seeing things as people versus the elite and making demands like Medicare for all that the elite would not grant, uh, he, he was a populist. So uh, again, I wouldn't get hung up over the difference between the, those terms. Aren't progressives possibly in that elite that populists oppose? Depends. Yeah. Bernie, Sanders, Bernie Sanders is, you a, can be is both. a progressive who takes a populist critique. Right, he, his ideology is not that different from Barack Obama's, but his critique of Barack Obama is that Obama is an elite, is captive to the elite interest. Uh, much like Donald Trump, who has lived his entire life as someone who is in the elite, but his argument is against political elitism. It's, it's, it, it's his, he doesn't really have a real beef with economic elitism, other than if it's a multinational corporation, but he does have a beef against political elitism, Jeb Bush, as personified by Jeb Bush, Hillary Clinton, sort of the existing legacy brands. I, I think, uh, let me just add something, because I, I don't think I answered that. that, w that I would draw a, a certain distinction between liberals and populists, for instance. Or you could do the same with conservatives and populists. Uh, in the sense that <coughs> liberals uh, believe in pluralism, and they want to present programs that will basically bring everybody together. But you know they might favor more the wor the working class or the middle class who they feel has not been given their due. But still, the things that business could be happy with. So, Affordable Care Act is a a, a liberal program in that sense. Uh, Medicare for all, you know, getting rid of the private insurance companies. That's that's more in the vein of populism. So that's the that's the kind of distinction I would make uh, between the two. Is the U.S. perspective on nationalism almost unique or perhaps exceptionalist as the only nation on earth um, which has the scale and resources to think it could possibly go it alone? Let me try that again. Did you get that? Or? Is the U.S. Uh, perspective on nationalism almost unique or perhaps exceptionalist because it is the only nation on earth which has the scale and resources to think it could possibly go it alone? Oh, we, you know, we've given that up since, uh, what, ni 1910. I mean, we're, we're integrated as part of the world economy. This big supply chain, Silicon Valley, completely depends upon uh, China, Japan. But I think the question about nationalism suggests... But, but well, no, I mean, could, could here, you, here's what I would say, that there's a big difference between, let, let's say, what people are thinking in Europe in the wake of, of World War II that nationalism there had led to these wars for centuries and centuries, so they had to have some kind of uh, supranational organization, <laughs> the European Union, uh, that would protect against these kind of uh, uh, conflicts leading to war again. So, you know, you get people there who are much more ambivalent about being uh, 
uh, German, for instance, as opposed to European. United States, Canada, you know, we're Americans, Canadians, are Canadian, Australia, all those countries. J Japan is more nationalist than we are. China also, so it's not, uh, it's uh, not something peculiar uh, to us. And multinationalism is always a series of compromises for, in order to achieve an, a desired objective. And I think it is not surprising that, that the United States is now reassessing and a great majority in both parties is reassessing our multinational commitments and, our, and how, many, how many of those sacrifices and sovereignty we're willing to make. What is more surprising to me is that it's taken this long after the fall of the Cold War for it to happen. Uh, this is a fun one. Can a centrist be a populist? Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the centermost candidate in the Republican primary in 2016, left of all of them. Yeah. He certainly ran to the left of all of them, well, for sure. Well, Perot was the centrist also. Tell us about a little bit about Perot. You have a lot of nice, uh, interesting material about Perot. Uh, in, he was uh, from Texarkana, which was a, uh, you know, tech, part of Texas on the border, which was once a, uh, <coughs> a hotbed of populism. But he didn't, he didn't make populism. it. He didn't make it. Can huh? a centrist win as president? Donald Trump won if he indeed is a centrist, and Perot did not. Well, y y you know, that was... That, that wasn't in, in, first of all, Perot tried to run an independent can. can Tell people what he ran for. Uh, Perot ran in 1992. Um, he was a um, wildly successful self-made uh, um, multi, multi-millionaire. I don't know if he was a billionaire. Uh, built his own computer company that um, uh, ended up doing all the uh, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid stuff. and. Um, for a while, also, he, they merged with General Motors, and, and he became very skeptical about uh, uh, corporations, American corporations, and the way they operated. And his uh, campaign uh, in 1992 was based upon this idea that we have to make things in the USA again. He was very much against the uh, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement, because he thought that that would be a, a sucking sound that would send all these companies uh, from the United States to Mexico, and he was absolutely right about that. But he was also a balanced budget guy. I mean, he had he had uh, he had different sides to uh, to to his politics. Uh, he wasn't a conventional Republican or Democrat. Uh, so that's why I say what he was much much more a centrist. Uh, he got in trouble because he really didn't know. Uh, he really wasn't ready for uh, what happens in presidential campaigns. And when he got on Meet the Press and things like that, uh, he would get uh, very prickly. Uh, and, uh, you know, and he ended up uh, uh, also the, a lot of con crazy conspiracy theories about the Black Panthers invading his house and things like that. And so uh, by July or so of 1992, uh, he had blown through his campaign manager uh, and Bill Clinton was on the rise, and he decided to withdraw from his campaign. Then he came back again in October, and he ended up getting, what, 20, 23% or something like that. So there was a real base for uh, Perot. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, his campaign was just too It's a too very weak. interesting character, and I believe he's still alive, is he not? Yeah, but I don't know what's happened to him. He's, he's not young. Yeah. Well, I, I, he I, wasn't young then. I, I think the question of, 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 of centrism it, can a centrist win is important, you know, and, I, and, and by the way, I predicted Donald Trump's demise in the primary process about 18 times on national television and in columns. So um, it, luckily, I'm the only one that didn't see it coming. So, I mean, every, no, everybody else was right about him all along. Um, he, he definitely ran to the left uh, of every Republican on economics. His announcement speech had 6,342 words. Not one of them was liberal. Not one of them was conservative. He thinks ideology is for chumps, for the most part. And, and, and sort of that, and, and, and American centrists, we all, on the Republican side, and we've done position paper after Blue Ribbon Commission report after every time we lose an election, we wear sackcloth and ashes and, you know, go into chanting and incantations <laughs> trying to figure out how we were rejected. And, and they all say the same thing. Oh, we have to move to the middle on social issues. Oh, we have to, we have to just continue to give people more tax cuts and corporatism and, and but yet change all the other things on the, on the other side of the spectrum. And all the Republican thinkers, people in my business, always expected that the great centrist movement and Republican centrist that would be elected would be economically conservative and socially liberal. Well, Donald Trump's the opposite. 
He's economically liberal and, so, and ran a socially conservative campaign. That doesn't mean it's any less centrist. It just means it c countered all the things that people in the elite had expected. I think you'd have to say that his positions on people of color and women are not centrist. Um, and uh, and uh, that might be, you might agree with that or not. I mean, I know you don't think it's as important as I do, but um, I, I am absolutely with you on the fact that he ran as the economic centrist candidate. The, all the Trump voters, not all, most <coughs> of the Trump voters I know who voted for him voted for him for that reason. But I think the way that things have campaigned, have about the campaign suggests that a lot of his base was going for something other than his economic centrism. I want to end with one question here that speaks directly to this. And let's, if you, let, just give for me, give to me, if you would, the idea that he is not in the center on social issues. Um, because you're arguing that a populist has, in, from the center, has in fact won the presidency. And I would like to argue that in fact, as right now, a populist from the center has not won the presidency. Because I don't think Donald Trump is in the center, except perhaps originally economically, I don't think he is anymore. But this, if, as a setup for this question is, why do those people who are left behind, the ones that you are all talking about, continue to vote against policies that actually would help them? That is, for example, the Affordable Care Act, uh, job retraining, bringing back coal, uh, environmental standards, and so on. Why do they continue to do that if it continues to simply push them further behind, as we know is in fact the case? Um, well, my view, what happened in 2018 was that some of those people came back to the Democrats because of uh, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, which again was something that Trump, you know, remember in 2016 he promised he was going to make uh, uh, insur health insurance more universal and cheaper, and I think Bannon again wanted him to do that, but he, uh, he ended up uh, dealing with the Tea Party people and uh, uh, agreeing to a, a bill in the House that basically repealed uh, the Affordable Care Act. So I think, that, I think that some of those voters, and I've seen polls, I'm not a big poll person, but I've seen polls that show that some of those voters, the, the Obama voters, came back uh, to uh, the Democrats over that particular issue. So I don't think it's, um, I, 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 I don't think, again, um, but part of the problem we're having in America is that we are fighting a lot of these issues over uh, culture. Uh, K Kavanaugh, Blasey Ford, uh, caravans with uh, Middle Eastern people, you know, sneaking into America. And it really makes it very hard uh, to deal with, again, this kind of uneven development that's happening in our country. Um, the, the anxieties that kids feel, the anxieties that the people in, let's say, Muncie, Indiana, or Akron, Ohio feel. Uh, so uh, what, that's what concerns me. How can we get beyond these kind of controversies and talk about the kind of things that really are bringing to the surface uh, uh, our, our present politics? So I think you're saying that they, deal, that they vote for things that are not necessarily in their favor economically because of cultural discussions. Is that correct? Well. No, I was saying that in the, look, look, I mean, I think if Hillary Clinton had run a perfectly boring campaign with a lot of <laughs> economic ish, uh, focus, uh, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. If she'd gone to Wisconsin, if she campaigned where Debbie Dingell, the congresswoman from uh, in Michigan had told her to campaign, you know, it would be a lot different. I think that people do respond to, uh, to, to these economic issues. But one of the results of this you know, two years or so of the Donald Trump and the battles between Fox and MSNBC is that we've developed this very simplified view of the American, of an American, of human nature, where there are certain people who are racist and sexist, and there's other people who aren't. And I think that that's very damaging. And I don't, I, 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 that's what I would like to see us get beyond. And that doesn't mean that I'm not critical of Trump when he talks about Mexican rapists and you know all that stuff, because I think that that does incite it. 
that does lead to the that that does lead to these kind of cultural divisions. But the cultural divisions are not as hard and fast as we think they are. I, so, I'd like so, to take issue. I, 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 I want I want to come back to this, but but again, you're saying it's economic, but it's gotten muddied by cultural stuff. Well, the, there's different dimensions to it, but you cannot. Uh, on the one hand, you have the the the. Uh, I, I quote a letter that uh, a, a Trump supporter sent me uh, to, uh, to use in my book about you know, how uh, the liberals want to turn mm -hmm. this country into a, into a Muslim nation. I mean, you know, crazy <coughs> charges. But on the other hand, you have the identification of Trump supporters with the alt-right, with Spencer and these people who really uh, think you know, that uh, blacks are inferior and Jews should uh, be sent back to wherever. So. Uh, again, I think it's both sides have a very simplified view of the other, and both uh, sides being the cult, the the cosmopolitan, culture. metropolitan. Well, I'm just trying to more untangle liberal, culture. More liberal on the one hand, conservative uh, left behind on the other. Well, I'm, I'm just, using a kind of si I, simplified. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out. You are both. All three of you are talking about economics, and now all of a sudden you're talking about culture. And I think you're going to come and say. You got, you got issues with bringing culture into this at all, is no, that right? No, I was going to say, you just stated that <laughs> voting against their interest with these well, X number of question, policies, but, but yeah. then you said things which we know are true. You have to let them decide that. They, they, why would you presuppose that more government centralization and more government control of economics makes them better off? Well, why, you, would you, why would you, well, you can't state that as a fact. Well, but you just said that that's why they're organizing as populists to take back their right, control. Right, but you stated that, this, that they would support policies that would hurt their interests. Well, I just, I reject the premise that the Affordable Care Act. Well, then why are they and, organizing and as greater, populists? Greater regu because the, they saw the Republican leadership not follow through. They, Jeb Bush creates Donald Trump. If Republican populists don't see Jeb Bush as the presumed pre presidential nominee, they, there is no Donald Trump. They saw that they felt that Republicans had failed in the aftermath of the Great Recession. They didn't hold Wall Street accountable. Paulson gives a, gives everything back away to Wall Street. Obama follows through the same thing. Obama extends government through Affordable Care Act. They felt they had no home. That's why you get someone like Donald Trump. And, and I say this as someone who I'm from a, a little place in East Tennessee that when I grew up had a paper mill, two hosiery mills, and a steel mill. Um, none of that's there now. Uh, it was a county Bill Clinton carried twice. Jimmy Carter carried overwhelmingly. Today, every Republican gets 75% of the vote. They, they can choose which direction they think the economic policies help them. It's not, I, I just reject the notion you could say, oh, they, why are they supporting policies that hurt them? Let them decide that. And That's their choice. I, I saw, I, I traveled to 49 different states. I saw plenty of small business people um, really impacted by the Affordable Care Act that hurt them, hurt their business, hurt their family, hurt their, per, their personal um, stakes. And so, you know, I mean, on paper, something might seem like it's, that would benefit them. But when you dig down and, and listen to people and uh, talk about how they're impacted by these um, things like the Affordable Care Act, you find a completely different story. Voting is complicated. You know, vote, voting isn't just black and white. There's a lot that goes into it. You think about your family. You think about your community. You think about your economic concerns. You think about the country. You think about national security. I mean, there's a bunch of things that go into it. OK, quickly, you get three <coughs> sentences to write the platform of the 2020 president from either party. I don't care. You can say or not. What's the platform going to say? <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, I don't do, I, on paper, I like uh, Sherrod Brown, but you can't tell. Well, uh, we don't want people at trade. This point. I sure don't want to un think about understand. People yet. You know, basic issues about trade. Trade. Uh, trying to um, uh, again res uh, revive certain parts of America that have been uh, that, that are not prosperous. Um, some kind of improvement of the Affordable Care Act. All, all those kind Which of things. Which is exactly what Trump ran on 2016. Well, right? no, that's what we, I mean. Okay. <coughs> Americans Good. are very aspirational. Same thing? Americans are very aspirational. I think an aspirational message that makes us feel like we're part of something bigger than themselves. Whatever party um, captures that, 
I think, something oh. aspirational. Terrific. And? I pay my mortgage by getting people to pay me to do this, and you're asking me to do it for free. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I think the 2020 election is a struggle for, uh, you know, Republicans have to get industrial and rural voters to vote a cause, and they have to get suburban voters to vote their interest. In 2018, we lost in the midterm election. It was a wipeout for Republicans, and you know with the 40 seats in the, in the U.S. House that Democrats are going to gain. There are also 390 seats in state legislatures. And to put that in perspective, Democrats only lost about 900, only lost 900 under Barack Obama. It's a massive loss, a huge shift over eight years. But Republicans have about lost half of that in one, in one midterm. Uh, so it is a, Republicans have a really big challenge because our coalition, uh, and I say as a Republican strategist, is looser now. And we have, to, we have two wings of it. And I think reclaiming suburban voters and, and really, that I, I see it was all a reaction to Trump's rhetoric and, and Trump's style. And so, finding a way to keep rural and industrial voters motivated uh, to vote to vote this sort of against Democrats, really the, the party that they think has left them, and get Republican <coughs> suburbanites to come back to the party they voted for their whole life. Uh, so, I think it will end up an economic message is actually essential for Republicans in the, in, in the midterms to to win over uh, suburbanites. But I would also say, just like when you go hiking two people and there's a bear, you don't have to outrun the bear. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Donald Trump will not be by himself. The midterms were a race about Donald Trump versus your expectations for how you wish Donald Trump had happened. Uh, the 2020 election will be about Donald Trump against a, a very defined entity uh, that will have pluses and minuses. Well, there you guys go. If anybody's planning <coughs> to run in 2020, you just got your free advice. Thank you very much and thank you to all three of you.